Greetings and welcome to the Upper Pen Podcast. My name is Dakota and today I'm talking with Benjamin Cray, author of Oh Great, I Was Reincarnated as a Farmer. His second book, Oh Great, I Discovered How to Cultivate a Farmer in 52 Easy Steps is out August 2nd. Benjamin, thank you for joining me. Hey Dakota, thanks for having me. And uh, yes, the second title is worse than the first. I <laughs> I heard what everyone was saying about how much they hated the first part, and I was like, you know, I could do worse. <laughs> so my first question is, the title is so long. What do you call yeah. it? Uh, I just refer to it with my friends. Uh, yeah, I write a book, just put my name in <laughs> Amazon, you'll find it. Yeah. <laughs> that works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I, I needed the second book because now I can call it by the series name, which is Unorthodox Farming. Which is okay. easier to explain to people. Yeah, yeah. 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 So much yeah. easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, then the uh, sentence you have to say for the entire title. Well, your friend also has another book, right? And yeah, his title's yeah. even longer, it looks like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Help, my wizard mentor had a heart attack. And now I'm being chased by giant spiders. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he told me that. He's like, I'm toying with the idea. I was like, that's so ridiculous, started laughing, and then I was like, no one should ever do that, you kept laughing, I was like, okay, it kind of works. <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, if, if you do this, at least I don't have the longest title anymore. Yeah, I mean, maybe, you could always go yeah. on to book three, right? And, and do something longer, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the cover will just be the uh, intro to Star Wars, where you've got all the kids coming down, um, yeah. Can it fold out the bottom so that it just keeps going? <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, I'd have to do a print run, but I'd be it'd be totally worth doing that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for the people who don't know what Oh Great I Was Reincarnated as a Farmer is about, can you give like a quick rundown? It is um, very hard to describe as a book, uh, but it's basically Home Alone for Adults. Yeah, yeah, okay, so, yeah. Yeah, so instead of um, the burglars coming to the house, it's a wacky gamer going, okay, I don't want to farm, and how do I um, get experience? I defend my farm. So I'm going to attract as many burglars as I can, and then I'm just going to off them in the barn. Okay. Um, yeah. So that actually brings up, like, I love this book because of its silliness, right? It's just yeah. very yeah. ridiculous concept. Yeah. Um, so how did you get to, he, Arnold really wants to farm, but he can't even hold a sword because it jiggles out of his hand? <laughs> well, that, that was pretty simple. That was, um, I, I was sick and tired of uh, looking at uh, lit RPG books where it's like, okay, this guy's a gamer, and then he goes to be a hero. It's like, I know a lot of gamers. I'm a gamer. And it's like, some of us do outside work, some of us do inside work. But most of us aren't going to be the one like charging through the trenches at the drop of a hat. I was like, so let's do a proper gamer who is a shut in, who does not like seeing the sun, who wakes up at noon and wants to keep living that lifestyle and is forced to actually go on a farm and, and do something he doesn't want. And when we get in, when we get into those positions where it's like we're stuck in a really crazy place that's when we start getting creative and that's when we start getting out of our comfort zone. And so it was very much, let's put him in a place he doesn't want to be and let's see how he gets out. I think your book is the only one that I can remember out of the lit RPG books that I've read that actually uses exploits as like a feature. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. it's so great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I played in deal with friends and rules lawyer lawyering um, the DM is like the most fun part of playing Dungeons and Dragons because you just get in these ridiculous arguments like, yes, I can do this because it says this and this and this. It's like, oh, I remember reading something truly stupid, which was um, the running speed is 60 feet. And technically you can, as a free action, pass something along. So if you get a hundred peasants and you line them up 60 feet apart and in one round they run with a stone and they pass it to each other, technically that stone has um, gone something like 6,000 feet in the space of six seconds. So you've created a, a peasant cannon and you should be able to destroy that castle. 
because that's how far that stone moved and how quickly it moved and that's science <laughs> that's beautiful now i want a peasant cannon <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 so um I, I i love the idea of exploits i, I love being that rules person in games so i was like okay let's put it as a feature of this world if you have a system if you've got it everyone's trying to get um to be a higher level everyone's trying to grow faster and so everyone's got to work out how to do this and it becomes a part of your society i love that he also makes exploits on how to sell his exploits or like he yeah. utilizes the exploits in the <laughs> yeah yeah um so it's like oh i found out something no one else knows sell it yeah <laughs> and, and, and that definitely continues into the second one and it will sort of continue into the third book where uh, it'll be the um escalation of everything that he's exploited and be like oh if i do this i can do this if this is true then this is true if this is true then this is true. okay so this is true oh god what have i done yeah. so you're gonna break this world ultimately I'm probably going to break Arnold, not the world. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, like, one of the things you, like, all gamers do is we, we like to um, get something to its very peak. And then what we accidentally do when we do that is we take the fun out of it because it's no longer a struggle. It's like, okay, I've made the most powerful bow. That's a dragon and it's dead. And so, uh, once we get to that stage, we're like, oh, oops, I shouldn't have done this. And the same is true in life. It's like, oh, look, I, I've done this, this, and this. I've created this new thing. I've transformed the world. Oh, this world wasn't ready for this. I probably should not have done this. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that I really enjoy about the book is it's there's got a there's a framing narrative of Arnold telling the story when he's older Arnold. Yeah, yeah. And does that this mean, you, does yeah, that this mean you know where it goes? <laughs> uh, I do. Well, I'm a discovery writer, which means I write by the seat of my pants and I don't really plan out too much. Um, I do kind of know where it goes. Um, but there are a couple of things like I'll sit down with an idea at the beginning of the book, be like, this is what's happening. This is what I'm going to do. This is going to be cool. And then I'll get like three quarters of the way through and be like, this was a terrible idea. What kind of heck came up with this? Man, old Ben was an idiot. I think that's and, how all writing goes, you know? <laughs> well, I, I've heard about some like mythical writers just like write it, it's done. I, mean, I, I think it's a lie, but they claim it's true. So yeah, like what was it? I was talking to Matt Dinman a while ago on Facebook and um, he's like, yeah, I really do write one chapter at a time and put it up on Royal Road. And I was like, oh God. I'm like draft eight by the time it's readable. <laughs> what I don't understand is he lets his um, Patreon folks like decide what's going to happen. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm there on the Patreon uh, deciding on uh, rewards and stuff. I, I was there when we, uh, what was it? When we gained the system, he's like, look, you can pick for one of these rewards. And we were all like, we want those two. So we made uh, the exact number of votes match. And then nothing else came close. And he was like, I forgot that you could do that. Okay, I'll put both in. And you could feel the frustration in his next message to the, um, everyone on Patreon. I was like, why did you do this to me? <laughs> you just do that to yourself, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I do it to myself, but that's fine. Because I don't have an audience seeing how badly it affects me. <laughs> Where it was hit and was like, Rrr. I think your book is incredibly popular right now. I don't know. People seem to talk about it a lot. Yeah, I, I've noticed that. Um, <laughs> I, I wrote a book I would like to read, basically. And I was like, I, I, I want people to read this because I want other writers to read this. And if they like it, I want them to write something similar so I can read it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my entire writing career will be me taking... Uh, ideas and being like, I want books like these, please make me more. I mean, I guess that makes sense. It's how like, what, cozy fantasy started, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. People are like, I want this, I want this, see this. Okay, give me more. 
Yeah. You can produce it now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You, you've got the template. Go and do it. Yeah. Um. Do, so, do you know how many books you want it to be? I was originally saying five, uh, but so when I started writing the second one, uh, the second book and what it will end up being the third book was one storyline. It was this big monstrous. Um, seven arc plot and it was going to be giant and epic and i'd reached like 180k and i got to the halfway mark in the book and i was like this is a little bit too big now and also this feels like a complete story and this feels like a complete story maybe this is two books and so um i kept tr like hitting my head against the wall for another three months going nah i'm sure i can turn this into one book um, before finally admitting to myself, no, I don't have that skill. These are two books. You have to break it and you have to stop being an idiot. And so <clears throat> at that point, I uh, split it. And so you're kind of getting the book two is the first half of that arc. And the the arc is, is how do I describe it? Um, when I was thinking of the this book and when I finally got the what it is in my head, it was very much that scene at the end of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory when um, Charlie asked, uh, where Willy Wonka asked Charlie, whatever happened to the uh, boy who got everything he ever dreamed of? He lived happily ever after. It's like, that's a children's fairy tale. And it's like Arnold at the end of book one, he's got money, he's got experience, he's got um, his idea to work, he's got friends, he's got everything um, that you could ever dream of. The problem is he hasn't worked on his issues. He hasn't, he, he hasn't, he's done everything he can in book one, to run away from his problems, to hide from his grief, to, he's, he's basically suicidal in the first book. He's willing to run towards monsters because that excitement distracts him. And he, the whole book is basically a cry, uh, the first book is a cry for help uh, of, I, I, I need something to, um, like, distract me from everything that's happened. And so book two is, I want to do great things, but the problem is I'm not in that state to do it. So book two is very much about Arnold recognizing his problems, working on his problems, but it's also about how your friends help pull you out of problems because it's very rare that we're the first one that notice where we have a problem. Most of the time it's our friends look at us and go, are you all right? And you think about it for a while, oh, I might not be all right. This is, this is harder than it used to be. This is a little less thing. So as a very, very weird thing I've gone and done, Chapter one of uh, book two is basically that heart-to-heart -heart scene you see 70% of the way through a novel. And it's that big, deep emotional talk that you're like, okay, this is, is, is like heavy and we've all been building to that. And I put that in chapter one. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what, what the story sort of starts off and sort of builds towards is Arnold working on his problems as he tries to help those around him and like come to terms with everything that's happening. I'm really to break the system a little. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. I'm really yeah. excited to hear that though, because one of the things that I was unsure about was if I was gonna like Arnold after the really dark scene at the beginning of the first book where yeah. he's beating the little girl. And yeah, I was yeah. like, I don't know if I can handle this, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that scene was very much uh, me going, not everyone's a hero. And I, I wanted to sort of point out at the very, very beginning, he wasn't a hero. And one of the things a lot of people don't get is the understanding of what the girl did. What she had basically done is she'd stolen her parents' keys to the car and gone for a joyride and, and killed someone. And it's one of those things that you end up in a fender bender with a teenager and they'll really crash in your car and someone can die. There's a percentage of the population that decks that person. And Arnold fell into that po uh, percentage of the population. And he was also depressed at the time. There was bad things going on. And it was one of those things where it's like, he might not have done it. And then the um, archbishop is like, do you want to go? Here's, here's a cane. It's like, this is happening anyway. I, I just need you to get angry enough to do something that makes you uncomfortable, that you're then distracted by how uncomfortable you are with your own actions. 
Um, Arnold wasn't really in control of his fate until about chapter three. Um, he was very manipulated. And you'll find out how manipulated by about book three. Um, I mean, Salem wasn't technically on his side at that point, of, I would point out. I mean, like he becomes an ally later, but I mean, was he really helping Arnold or was he helping the king's daughter in that time? It's like, do we want to politically destabilize a country by having the king's daughter be uh, tried for murder? Probably not. This is not going to be good. This is going to lead to a lot of, a lot of bad things. Um, I really like in that scene after he goes through that he's really emotional and he's just like kind of distraught that this happened and he did this and like yeah. it's really jarring to have at the beginning of the book which is and it's a funny yeah. book too so it was like a really good juxtaposition yeah yeah it, it, it's a very strange place to start with a comedy <laughs> I mean normally people have to drown a little first right to be yeah, just... yeah. yeah. and it, it's one of those things like if you've ever been in, in, in one of those situations where everything sort of just changed in a few minutes, um, you don't know how to react. Your emotions are all over the place. We like to think that we're calm, collect individuals, but when something truly throws us, we're wrecked and we don't make logical choices. And it can be for a very long time. Um, and it was one of those things like, this is something that would wreck you. And I, and I wanted, it was definitely one of those things I really wanted to show, the honest reaction to what happens when you lose everything in an instant. You might get something great on the other side, but you, you still have to have that human reaction of what you lose. I, I'm quite a big fan of uh, Dungeon Crawler Cal, like most people. Um, but I, I love that series because he doesn't really get that chance to do the, we've lost everything. It's a we've got to keep running because we've got to survive and it's one of those books i'm like okay you don't have to deal with him having lost everything in the world going crap because he's just trying to survive but in a lot of places you don't um have that fear of oh i'm gonna instantly die and so it's like okay when we can slow down our brains start to think about everything that's a problem and so i just wanted to show that I love that you could have let him do that with the the like caravan ride, but he chose yeah. fast travel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I like that it it he's just like passed out the whole time or like in a coma. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I I was like, what what what's the weirdest thing we can do at this moment? Well, it wasn't really that. I was like, let, 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 let's uh, get him from here to here. And I, I originally wrote about like a three chapter arc where he's moving from there to there and it did not work because I don't, well, I do know why. Um, trying to do the big emotional breakdown while you're doing a travel log when no one knows the character, way too hard. And it just did not work well as a story of trying. So I was like, okay, we're going to put fast travel. It's like, okay, we've got to, work out why the heck fast travel exists and i was like okay here's all the the mechanics for why fast travel exists where you put it in it's actually a really horrendous skill i i i, I, uh, I developed for this it's it's really designed for we're running away from orcs and we don't want the children to be one loud while you're running away from orcs and two conscious because they might be eaten a lot and I was like, okay, so this is how it fits in their society. It has a place, it has a purpose, it's horrendous, and she's abusing her power to do this to Arnold. Perfect. Yeah, it worked great in the yeah. <laughs> in the book. Yeah. Um, so how do you balance the the funny versus like going over the top? Um you make it's 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 hard to make sure sure you don't go into slapstick you don't make a joke for the sake of a joke kind of thing um it's is this possible yes could it happen this badly yes okay we'll put it in it's the the is it possible is the first one you kind of have to um answer if you're reaching for that joke and you're sort of um making up the circumstances that this would happen 
then you start going to that territory where people are like, this is kind of absurd. But if you stay in that sort of, is this possible? Um, people will go, okay, it's weird, but I'm going to go with it. And that's hilarious. It, that's, that's, the, that's the ghost. The, the, the ghost scene that people seem to love, which is a really weird thing to love. My favorite view, view is that uh, this is the funniest use of necrophilia I've ever seen. <laughs> So yeah. my boyfriend, and, um, my boyfriend read it first, and he's like, "You have to listen to it." There's a ghost scene, and she basically tries to molest him. And I was like, "What? <laughs> Why is this funny?" <laughs> yeah, well, it was the, one of those things. It's like, okay, go, we all um, we've seen so many supernatural shows and movies, and the like. Ghosts always try to relive their death or relive some part of their life. They're always doing it. it's like adults have sex. Why is this not happening with ghosts? And it's like, it, it's, it's funny because she's an old, um, older plump farmer's wife. And, and it's like, Arnold's like injured, he's sleeping. He's been totally ignoring everyone. Of, we need to get rid of this ghost, they're a menace. And so Arnold gets his comeuppance. It's like, you come to a new world, people have got like things you have to worry about. And if you totally ignore um, everyone around you and the advice you're getting, bad things are going to happen. And love so- Go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, that sort of humor has to come out of, is it possible? And once you've got that, is it possible? Um, you can put something as absurd as that scene in a book and it doesn't break the world and it doesn't break the narrative. I, that does make a lot of sense. Like it, yeah. I like how you straddle it. It is very like, how would somebody really react in these moments? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, I love the um, those sorts of moments because that's when the reader goes, oh, that's what I would do. Um, yeah, I, I remember uh, reading this thing about um, Stephen uh, from Stephen King. I think he was talking about horror books, and it's like, what makes a true horror a horror is when you um, see the protagonist and they make a smart decision. You're like, yeah, that's what I do. That's really smart. And it still goes badly for them because then the reader, because they they emotionally connect with the character, like I'd totally do that, and they realize it's the wrong decision, and that they they would have made that decision, and then they die. It freaks people out, and that's that where that horror comes in. But it's also the same thing with comedy: is when characters go, when uh, readers go, yeah, I would totally do that. Oh gosh, I would totally do that. That's really embarrassing. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. That's that's a little bit too much like me. Yep. Yeah. Guys, you gotta come see this. Someone put me in a book. It's awesome. <laughs> I love that when he goes into town to get the um, the ghost evicted or like exercised, they're like, yeah. "Why?" It yeah. sounds like she's cleaning your house and feeding you. <laughs> yeah, they're like, "Okay, you, you you've got a trade off here." It's like it's it's one of those things. Is um, you 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 might look at it as a problem. And someone else like. Well, there's positives and negatives. As long as you can lower those negatives, it's actually an overall win. Yeah, yeah. It works. <laughs> um, so the traps that he creates, yeah. um, they're kind of funny because they are very much home alone -y now that you mention yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's, it's one of those things is um, medieval, they're, they're high into medieval technology, Renaissance sort of era. It's like there's a limited amount of stuff you can build, and there's also a limited amount of stuff that Arnold has the technical skill to build. He can build a giant swinging axe because that thing's just dropping from one side to the other. But like, if you're trying to get a um, a gear-driven mechanism, that's going to go up and over his head. And so that's why when Quilly and everything starts coming in, it's like, okay, we've got central pivot points, we've got like. We've got the roof moving and everything's sort of adjusting on the fly. And this place doesn't look dangerous even though it is. And the, it's also one of those things that's like, professionals are professionals in any era. And it's like, we might look at like some things from like 400, 500 years ago and go, okay, you could do this. Like you could probably do this, but you also probably couldn't. You could do this with Wikipedia and access to the internet you can't do this off the top of your head and I, I very much wanted 
Arnold to be one of those people that like went, went oh I can't do this let's find someone who can and let's 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 bring them in my my favorite thing about book one is uh what I did with Brennan so there's a there's a huge trope in fantasy novels which is the farm boy is happy on his farm until the wise old wizard comes and takes him on an adventure and I did the exact opposite which was the farm boy stuck on his farm can't leave his farm attracts his adventure to the farm and then goes and gets a wizard to tell him how to do it there i love that when they're building the traps um and he has yeah. to go get experts they're like what do you need this for yeah yeah <laughs> what are you doing on your farm <laughs> why on earth would any farmer need this this makes no sense why would a noble need this it's like, nobody does this sort of thing and then he brings the wizard and their town gets upgraded yeah. so they're like never mind i don't want to know it's fine yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we're good we're good yeah it's it's like a lot of people a lot of readers um point out like oh people would have invented this people would have uh like come up with this before and i i'm i i'm one of those people that used to think that i'm like oh yeah they, this would have been done and then I saw the instant Legolas. If you've ever been on YouTube at 3 a.m. and you've clicked on 10 different things on medieval weapons, you'll randomly end up seeing the instant Legolas, which is a really, really weird thing. It's basically kind of like you cross a uh, bow with a crossbow with a pump action shotgun with a bunch of other things. Basically, it's one bow going your normal curve, then another bow in front of it. And then like a kind of like a stop for a gun. And what happens is the stop pushes forward the first bow, which puts pressure pushing backwards. And when you get to the full extent, it locks into place and then it starts pushing on the string going backwards. So when you draw the second bow backwards, the bigger one, you have assist from the front bow. And what you basically end up is a really powerful repeating bow that you can add a magazine to. And they've proven that this was possible with medieval technology, but literally the first person to think of it and like actually make one made it two and a half years ago. And this is 500 years, well, 400 years after that technology is obsolete. And it's like, it makes total sense. It's terrifying as a weapon. Like imagine being in the medieval era, you run into, uh, a hundred archers and they literally fire 10 arrows at you at 15, in 15 seconds each. Yeah, you just stopped and, storming that castle. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and, and this is something that could have existed, but it didn't because we don't have these concepts in our society. And, and it's one of these things that a lot of people don't realize how many concepts we actually have in our society that didn't exist even as little as 200 years ago. Um, like it really surprised me that the idea of putting yourself in someone else's, else's shoes. So thinking from someone else's perspective, that's a relatively new idea that's only existed for about 200 years. Um, there was a, not a study because they didn't do studies, but there was a test um, uh, someone did and tried to get the general population to do this about 150 years ago. And only about one in 20 could do it because it was so far and everyone was like no i'm me that's him how would i think about being like him it was just never introduced in my life so I didn't think about it. a small percentage of people could do that but it's actually a learned skill and until we have that as part of our society we we just don't think of things that way hmm. yeah i, I mean <laughs> I'm almost positive there's still people out there who uh, cannot put themselves in other people's shoes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I do live yeah. in the United States, so. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I constantly try to put myself in the shoes of someone who goes to the gym like five times a week, and I just mentally can't do it. It's, it's a real struggle. I just don't understand that mentality well enough to like want to do it and eating healthy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm there with you. Yeah. I have a gym membership they, that's like, yeah. I'm supposed to go. I don't really exist. I just don't understand how that thinking pattern works. <laughs> All right. Well, are you working on anything else? 
Um, so I finished book two and I'm currently working on trying to write a cultivation novel because every so often I get like an idea for a book that bounces around in my head and it bugs me and bugs me and bugs me. And I'm going to see if this one works. And if it doesn't work sort of in like the next month or so, I'll put it aside and go, well, okay, that was a bad idea. I have a lot of bad ideas. And uh, move on to, uh, I wrote two novels while I was trying to write the second book. So uh, when I was writing the second book, I reached that, that tough period where I was like, I'm pretty sure these are two books. I, I need some perspective. So I was like, oh, I had an idea for a book. I was like, I'll write this. And like three and a half weeks later, I was like, oh, I'm done. Okay. That's, that's one draft out of the way. I better go finish the first draft of this other book that I'm meant to be writing. And so I started working on it again, fixed up a bunch of things. It's like, no, I'm pretty sure this needs to be two books. Okay, I need another break. So I took, took a month off and I wrote another book. And um, that one actually ended up on Rural Road. That's, uh, I think it's currently called Welcome to the Universe. And that's a sci-fi tower defense. I love sci-fi more than I like fantasy. I don't know how I got sucked into so much fantasy recently. <laughs> yeah. Well, there hasn't been that much sci-fi recently that's come out that's like uh, really good. Yeah. Um, no one's really pushing the boundary right now Now with sci-fi. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and because of that, it's, it's, it's hard to um, get into the books right now. Plus, all the media, like visual sci-fi, is awesome right now. Um, there are a lot of good TV shows that have come out, and you're like, that's awesome. But the book's slow. And, and so it, it's very, very hard for sci-fi right now. Um, um, but, yeah, so so I, wrote, I wrote that, and um, if the cultivation novel doesn't work out, I'll go back and edit those two up and probably publish them. One is the sci-fi book, uh, which is a um, apocalyptic power defense book. And the other one is a, I, I'm not sure what I would call it. It's a um, Florida man gets, dies, um, and basically gets told, look, you can compete in a war between gods. And if you get enough points, you can buy your way into heaven. And so it is a, it's a story of no one gets out of this alive and you have to get as many points as you can to get into heaven. And you probably shouldn't be there. You're not a bad person, but you're not the greatest person. And it, it, it's, it's, it's very much a, look, the Lord of Light is offering you a thousand points a day to defend this village. But the uh, King of Hell is offering you 8,000 points per villager you kill. Which one do you do? Yeah. And then it's like, oh, you accidentally killed this village. Your standing with the Lord of Light has gone down. Your ally is now trying to kill you. You probably need to like sort this out. Should I go and make a deal with those guys or should I do it with these guys? And so it's very much, okay, I'll join your side, then I'll backstab you, and then I'll then you'll backstab me, then I'll backstab you. And it's just utter chaos and fun. <laughs> One of your books on Royal Road has a Florida man. Uh, no, no. So that's not the Royal Road one. That was the sci-fi one. <laughs> Florida Man is the uh, wild card um, book I'm writing. It's okay. Florida Man, um, a dancing bear, and a belly girl um, basically take on uh, a war of the gods. <laughs> and, yeah. And so th th this, was, this was me going, some people love overpowered main characters. I'm going to write the most overpowered main character ever. And, but you had to throw them in a scenario that made sense where you'd have ridiculously overpowered um, characters. It was like, okay, war between the gods. Yeah. <laughs> and this is how gods decide how reality lays out. They, they, they do a war. The winner of the war gets to tweak reality. And they play in another season. And the problem is with gods is you're omnipotent, you're omnipotent, you know how everything goes and you know how your opponent's going, going to do everything. So you need wild cards, which are agents of chaos that you don't understand, which twist everything. 
So what's the most uh, powerful agent of chaos out there? Well, it's Florida man. Yeah. It breaks my heart a little that that's a meme even in New Zealand. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's just traveled this far. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 we, we know. We, we know and we understand. And we're like, it's, some of it's impressive. Some of it's like, oh, God, is that something that actually happened? Yeah. Um, I think my favorite weird Florida news story was somebody stole an entire truck like a semi truck of Crisco, yeah. had it for three days, yeah. and then left it on the side of the road. Like, yeah, what happened? What? Yeah, I I, I love the <laughs> um I, I love the weird stories of like oh yeah, they broke into someone's house and shaved the dog, made a sandwich and then left, and you're just like, what? What? Yeah. So it's not going to be that much of Florida, man, but it's very okay. much a, I had to leave Florida very quickly because I accidentally sunk the, the governor's um, yacht while trying to jump it with a tractor. But the mayor of like Jacksonville bit me, I could uh, bit me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm down. I'll read it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's a very, very, weird and, and fun story that you can't take people seriously. So you said that one's not on Royal Road? No, nah, that's not on Royal Road. Uh, that, that's a, still in the, oh God, this is an unreadable mess for our stage. Yeah. Well, one, it is yeah. a readable mess. Yeah. I'll read it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so right now, Cultivation novel, cultivation novel doesn't work out. I'll fix out those two, get those done. And then I'll get back to book three of Arnold. Um, this is the first sequel I've ever uh, written for Arnold. I have written 13 first novels at this point. And this was like, well, like common writing sense is like, if you want to improve writing, write throwaway novels. So write a novel, throw it away. The process of writing it improves you. But also, if you want to be a professional writer, write first novels of multiple series because then you can submit multiple things. If no one likes one type of book, well, it doesn't matter that you have the second and third one because no one likes the first one. So um, I, I practice a lot writing first novels. Writing second novels is very, very weird. You have like established storylines and like, uh history and like you can't change things because there's a book there and people read it it's, it's very uh uncreative <laughs> there's like established things that have to happen <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah when, when you're a pantser and you just write what you, you think is interesting and fun and entertaining you're like cool i've done everything i want and then when you write the sequel you're like i have rules now i don't do well with rules well, good. You have a book where you can break all the rules, you know? Yeah. You just have to find a writer exploit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, so hopefully six month gap and then I'll get on to the um, third one. I, it was one, I've just learned how to write a sequel, which was weird. And so I'm very happy with that um, because I'm pretty sure that writing the third one is going to be easier. But once I get to the very end of the six, uh, series, which will be book six-ish, um, that's when I'll get to the stage of, I've now got to work out how to write a final book. I've got to learn how to wrap up everything so that everyone's satisfied. This is going to be horrible. Um, but yeah, uh, like once I was getting, when I was getting to the end of the second book, I was like, I am tired of being an Arnold's head. Like Arnold doesn't like farming. Arnold doesn't like doing this and that. Uh, my, one of my favorite things for reviewers is uh, people going, why does this guy hate farming? Me, not Arnold. It's like, Farmers are like the background of everything. I'm like, I'm really happy that you think I hate farming because I both live on like a 10 acre rural block and I, I was a beekeeper for eight years and I, I've been on and off farms for like most of my adult life. <laughs> it's like, so I'm very happy that I wrote a book that you seem to think like implies that I hate farming and everything to do with it because that is so not me. <laughs> I mean, clearly you are Arnold. Very clearly. Oh, yeah. 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 
if, if I if I had popped up in that bit, I would be like, oh, fine. Interesting. Uh, we can do this. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, I'm going to go do something crazy. I'm like, no, fine, fine. I'm going to be a beekeeper here. I can do this. That works. Yeah. yeah. Um. So my final question is kind of off track, but it's um. So you live in New Zealand. Yep. Is there? Kiwi. <laughs> you're Kiwi. <laughs> is there a large lit RPG following in New Zealand? Um, I'm not sure. I've had one Kiwi read my book and be. Oh no, sorry. I've had three Kiwis read my book and be like, Ah, oh, yay! We have a Kiwi uh, lit RPG writer. And then I've had like five of my friends read my book. And so I think we don't. So I've got more friends that have read my book than like random Kiwis. Um, also like, because one of the useful things about Amazon is you can track sales. So like between New Zealand and Australia, it's like I've sold, sold like a thousand copies. So it's like, okay. So there's maybe like, because Australia's bigger, 150 people in New Zealand so yeah yeah well i mean you know compared to the united states it's pretty small that seems yeah. equitable yeah 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 so so there is no chance of me ever running to anyone who's ever read my book yeah, yeah. well but yeah. it would be really weird if it was a huge genre again like come to new zealand it's like yeah we've got as many fans as the united states just new zealand it's all kiwis we well, it sounds like you're converting your friend into a lit RPG author too. I, oh, well, yes, I, I'm very happy. I, um, well, because we went to high school together. And so there was, this was like two years ago when I was like, I'd finished the first animal book. It's like, oh, damn it. Why did I write a lit RPG? Because um, I always wanted to be traditionally published. And I was like, why did I write a lit RPG novel during lockdown? I can't get this traditionally published. I have to self-publish. I know nothing about this. This is going to be such a pain. And so um, I, I, I was very lucky because he came back from Argentina because he's over there living for a while because uh, it was lockdown. It's like, it's too hard to do lockdown over there. I'm coming to New Zealand, it's easier there. And so he, he walked me through getting self-published and it's very, very great for us. Like I'd read a couple of his like uh, fantasy novels and like, they're not my cup of tea most of the time. I was like, you should totally write a lit RPG film. You've got the like writing chops for this. You could totally do this. And so he did this and I was like, and then I read it because I got to read the draft and I was like, I love this. This this is this is Dub Douglas Adams level um, storytelling. This is ridiculous. It's over the top. Um, have you read it? I have not read it yet. Okay. Have you read Douglas Adams? Yes. Yes, okay. I have. <laughs> so, so you know the second book, the uh, restaurant at the edge of the universe, uh, the uh, would you like to meet your meat scene? Yeah. Yeah. The food culture is very, in, in that book, is very much just that taken through a whole book. <laughs> and, yeah, and the book is weird by Lit RPG sands, but if you read Douglas Adams and you enjoyed it, you're like, okay, I totally understand where this is coming from. Yeah. Well, I'm going to pick it up now. Okay. Yeah. It, it's just so strange. It, it is, like, Arnold's the worst person to, to like, become a farmer this guy's probably the worst person to be a chosen <laughs> think of a uh pretentious hipster trying to be the chosen one yeah yeah, yeah. And, okay. and, and 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 not really wanting to be the chosen one because like he's got things to do and other stuff to do but he doesn't know what he what other stuff he's doing it's just stuff yeah <laughs> things yeah. and stuff you know <laughs> so that that's very uh, that is very very fun. So he he he's the reason why I ended up self publishing, and I managed to convince him to write a lit RPG, and I enjoyed it. And I was like, yes, that's exciting. You're expanding lit RPG. Yes. Oh, oh sorry. That's what the original question. As you can see, I'm the next expert, and I like to talk, and I go off and turn this quite a lot. So um, yeah, so I am slowly converting all my friends to being lit RPG readers. They were all fantasy readers, so that was easier. Um, once Dungeon Crawl Card came along. So I'm just, now it's like, okay, 
this is a really bad place to start. This is the pinnacle of the genre. It's all downhill from here, but the downhill's pretty good. And um, so I start them off with uh, Daniel Crawler Carl, and they love it. And so this is how I get everyone in. Um, and it's very, very funny because it's like sometimes like, okay, I'll try it. I'll, I'll read a chapter. I'll listen to the first chapter, see how it goes. And then they're like, so I didn't sleep last night. Thanks for that. And I'm like, you're welcome. <laughs> That's exactly how I got into lit RPG. Cause I'm like, I don't, I'm not a gamer. I don't really, you know, I play Dungeons and Dragons, but that's about it. And then my yeah. boyfriend was like, no, you don't no. understand. <laughs> yeah. If you play Dungeons and Dragons, I will almost guarantee you'll love lit RPG. Yeah. 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 And it's, I it's, love how I love how ridiculous you're allowed to be in lit RPG. Yeah. Things you could never get away with in fantasy, you can get away with in lit RPG, which is just absolutely awesome because um like it is very much that Dungeons and Dragons, you're playing a tabletop game with your friends humor. It's like yeah. we're going to do this. It's ridiculous. It's like you can't do that. He rolled a natural 20 and he's a bard. He's got plus 13 to his persuasion role. He can do this. Yeah. He's allowed to sell ice to Eskimos. <laughs> I mean, that's how we got ice skating owl bears in our campaign. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. You know, we sold them to yeah. the circus. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, uh, trying to think of what. Ah. Uh, so we started playing D and D at my um, my uh, brother's place, and his flatmate and her partner came in, and we're having a discussion because we're just like raiding a towel with hags, and we freed a bunch of like uh, slave children, but we didn't get there in time. So there's some ominous-looking cupcakes there. Yeah, um, and so one of one of our players is playing a I can't remember I think it's a goblin. And so, of course, he's eating the children cupcakes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so they walk in, and their first experience of D&D &D is us having a heated across-the-table debate of how it is cannibalism, that just because you've put children into cupcakes, it doesn't stop it from being cannibalism. It's like, my mate was going, but they're cupcakes. It's not cannibalism. They're cupcakes. <laughs> Playing his character to a T. And it's like, cannibalism is if you eat people it's like these aren't people these are cupcakes they're made out of people and so that was their first introduction to uh dungeons and dragons which was a 15 minute debate of whether or not children cooked into cupcakes is cannibalism and, and these people are not nerdy they're not gamers so it was very very bizarre for them and like highly amusing <laughs> Gosh, it's always great what people walk into, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that about covers all of my burning questions. Um, right. So thank you so much for being here. No problem. Thank you for having me. It was a <laughs> lot of fun. Um, as for everybody watching or listening, uh, if you haven't read Oh Great, I Was Reincarnated as a Farmer, it's your loss. You're really missing out, so... Just go buy the, it. The <laughs> second book comes out on uh, the second of August. Ah, uh, yes. Audio book and ebook on the same day. Yeah. Is it still uh, Travis Baldry narrating? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Travis is awesome. Um, it, Travis will be doing the rest of the um, series, even if he does become like even crazier and more busy than he already is. So there might be like a two or three year wait on that audio book. Yeah. I'm willing to wait. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> he does a very, very good job. I'm As a way. Oh, oh go sorry. ahead. I'm proofing the uh, audiobook right now, and it's better than the first one. Yeah. I, I like the, the first one had, like, sort of, how do I describe it? When I was actually, I'm going to go off on a long tangent here. So uh, that's okay. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, so when I first published, I, I, I spent seven years working towards being a published author and I wanted to go to tradition publishing and all that. And I 
say like with a hundred percent honesty, not for two seconds in that entire seven years of wanting to get traditionally published, did I ever consider that my book would ever become an audio book? It, it went so over my head. So like five days after I published, an audio book company started contacting me. I was like, oh God, audio books are a thing. I completely forgot about this. Oh God, they're they're like as big as eBooks in, in the genre. Oh God, there has to be an audio book. I know nothing about audio books at all. I, I, I've never listened to an audio book. I haven't thought about an audio book. And then there's the whole panic coming in like, oh God, I didn't like write this, be spoken out loud. And, and so I never had that like that aspect of it in mind. And so first book I, I, I listened to, I was like, eh, this could be better. And the second book I've done, I'm like, okay, I, I, I clearly did actually think with like people reading this out loud in mind, this, this sounds better than book one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, now why you got to wait for August? Come on. <laughs> the proofing thing. Yeah. Yeah. But plus I, it gives me like time to be slack and like take a holiday. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. holidays in New Zealand. Yeah. yeah, terrible, <laughs> terrible. Yeah. Um, as always, thanks for listening. And I'd love to hear what your guys' favorite part of Oh Great, I Was Reincarnated as a Farmer was. <laughs> yeah. Have a great day.